I'm Mark Arenes, and this is Euler's Melting Pot. In this challenge, we try to complete every Project Euler problem in a different programming language. Today's challenge is problem number 17. Write the numbers from 1 up to 1,000, inclusive, in words, and count the total number of letters included in all of the words together. This problem factors easily into two steps. First, we need to convert each number into words, and then we need to count the characters. The second part is more straightforward, so we'll start with that. Today, we'll be doing our draft in Java. Count letters is a function that takes a string and returns a count of the number of letters in that string, using the Unicode definition of letter. Next, we'll write our two words function. This function takes an integer from 1 to 1,000 inclusive, and returns that integer written in English words. There are a lot of ways to structure this function, and it would honestly make a pretty good interview question. We'll just dive straight in. We start with several special cases. These are basically all of the unique tokens that will appear in our words. The numbers from 1 up to 19 are unique, as well as 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. Finally, we'll special case 1000, since it's the only four-digit number we care about. After dealing with all of our special cases, we check the general cases. If our number is divisible by 100, then it's simply the leading digit followed by the word 100 written out. Next, if our number is greater than 100, then we take the hundreds place and convert it to a word, then insert the word and, then take the final two digits and convert those to a word. Finally, we've dealt with all the numbers greater than or equal to 100, and our special cases handle values less than 20 and those divisible by 10. So the only case left is a two-digit number with both digits non-zero. In that case, we take the two digits separately and concatenate the result with a hyphen. So for example, for the number 21, we'll call two words on 20 and then two words on 1 and hyphenate the result. Finally, we write our main loop. We keep a count, iterate from 1 to 1000 inclusive, and sum up the letters in the word representation of each number. At the end, we print our total. This program runs, and it runs efficiently, but let's spice it up a bit. Java 8 introduced a streaming API. Streams are sort of like iterators, except that they provide several methods familiar to functional programmers, such as map, filter, and a fold-like operation called collect. On top of that, the stream API is built with a parallelism first model, so many of the streaming operations can be applied in parallel over the data if the underlying stream supports it. The key rule behind the streaming API, following its origins in functional programming, is immutability. Streams can't be used to modify mutable arrays or dictionaries, and should not depend on side effects outside of the input data and any closures given explicitly to the stream function. We can get a stream over any Java collection with the .stream method. Once we have the stream, we can perform the usual functional style stream operations, such as map and filter. To consume the stream and produce a scalar at the end, we can use collect, which is a general purpose mutable folding operation. Collect takes a collector object, which indicates how to iterate over the resulting stream. Though usually we don't write instances of this interface directly, and instead use one of the many implementations available in the Java standard library. Let's modify our existing Java solution to use streams when appropriate. Our count letters function was written using a for loop before. In English, I would explain this function as follows. We start with an intermediate variable called total, then we iterate over the array of characters. For each character, check if that character is a letter. If so, add one to the total, and finally, return the total. That's an accurate description of this function, but it's not how I really think about the function. If you asked me to describe the work being done here, I'd say, count the letters in the string. Or, slightly more explicitly, take a string, take only the letters, and count them. And that's exactly what the streaming API is going to let us do. First, we get all the characters from the string. Pairs is a method on the string class which produces a stream of all of its characters in order. Next, we want to keep only the letters. The act of keeping only elements which satisfy some condition is called filtering. So we'll call the filter method. The characters we want to keep are those which are letters, so the function which discriminates our elements is character is letter. Finally, we want to know how many elements satisfy this condition. We could use collect for this, but since counting is such a common task, Java provides a helper function to do just that. Now let's take another look at our main function. We have another loop, but this one isn't counting elements. Instead, it's summing them. Fortunately, we can do that with streams as well. Thinking about this as a streaming function, I would describe it as follows. Take all of the integers from 1 up to 1000 inclusive, get the letter count for each one, and then sum the total. Written in code, we take the closed range from 1 to 1,000. Then we take each element and count the letters in the word representation of it. Finally, sum the result and print it out. Now we have a fairly neat modern Java solution to our problem. Let's talk about the language of the week. The language we'll be working in this week is named Slashalash, and it's written as three forward slashes. This is a text substitution-based programming language, and the rules are remarkably simple. There are no variables, there is no stack, there are no functions, no other state, your entire program memory is the source code you supply. Program execution proceeds by reading one character at a time. If the character read in is neither a backslash nor a forward slash, then it's treated literally and printed to standard output. If it's a backslash, then it's treated as the start of an escape sequence, and the following character is printed literally, even if it's a forward or backslash. 
Finally, if the character in question is a forward slash, the program reads substitution in a format similar to said. That is, it reads up to the next two forward slashes, treating the first body as the needle to search for, and the second body as the replacement text. So if the interpreter encountered this string of text, it would interpret it as a replacement command which replaces every instance of the letter lowercase a with the letter lowercase b. The substitution applies immediately to the remainder of your source code and can replace overlapping matches. So for example, this string will be an infinite loop if there's at least one instance of the letter a to replace as the replacement will insert another A into the source code, which must then be replaced again. Note that, unlike said, these are not regular expressions. The only special character in a pattern or replacement is the backslash, which treats the next character literally and allows us to insert or match slashes in our program. And that's it. No arithmetic, no variables, no other looping or conditional constructs. Despite all of that, slash alash is actually Turing complete, which means it can answer any computable decision problem, just like, say, Python or Ruby can. I'm not going to explain how slash alash is Turing complete because the actual proof is very technical. Instead, I'm just going to demonstrate a couple of sample programs in the vein we're going to work in today. The simplest program is, of course, Hello World. Since this program requires no loops or complicated conditionals, we can simply write the letters we want to print literally into our program, and that's all we have to do. Let's do something a bit less trivial. Let's write a program that prints out the old 99 bottles of beer song. Starting at the number 99, we want to print out this verse of the song, decreasing the value halfway through the verse until we get down to the very end when we have no more bottles of beer. Doing this in a mainstream language like Java is fairly trivial and only requires some minor special casing to get the plurality of the word bottle correct. On the other hand, we could simply write out all the lyrics to all 100 verses ourselves, and that would constitute a valid slash alash program which prints out the lyrics. But that's not very enlightening, so let's see if we can write something slightly more intelligent. Here's the basic idea. Rather than writing out each verse by hand, we're going to look for some common patterns. And anytime we see a string repeated, we'll replace it with a particular symbol and do a replacement to convert that symbol into the repeated string at runtime. So, for instance, the string bottles of beer on the wall, followed by a comma and a new line, is repeated at the start of each verse. We'll denote that by a hash sign, and the first substitution we'll do will replace all hash signs with this string. Note that our substitution text includes a new line, so when we replace the hash sign, the resulting string will have a new line at the end, which makes sense given that we're trying to print the lyrics of the song with line breaks in between. Now, the second and third lines of the song always contain the common phrase, bottles of beer, take one down, pass it around. So we'll denote that whole string with a dollar sign. For our last substitution, we'll replace percent signs by the text, bottles of beer on the wall, followed by two new lines to separate the verses of the song. Now comes the fun part. We simply need all the numbers from 99 down to 2. Fortunately, with the power of video editing magic, I can make them appear. The last line of the two bottles verse, as well as the entire final verse, are special case, since we need the singular form of the word bottle in each of those lines. And now, in 12 lines, we have the code to print the lyrics to our song. Amusingly, that's 11 lines shorter than our Java program to do the same. There's one other trick I want to draw attention to before we move back to the Project Euler problem. Line 6 is looking a little bit long, and it would be nice if we could do something about that. So what we're going to do is break this line into multiple relatively equal length lines. But we have a small problem. Those extra new lines will show up in the result right now, which we don't really want. But at the same time, there are other new lines, such as those between verses, that we do want in the final output. We'll put a star immediately preceding a new line that exists purely for readability purposes. And then the very first substitution we'll do will replace a star, followed by a new line with the empty string, effectively getting us back to how our program looked before. All right, let's talk about the Project Euler challenge. Our approach is pretty similar to what we did in Java. First, we'll enumerate all the numbers from 1 to 1,000, then we'll convert all of them to their word form, and finally, we'll count the digits. We're also going to break down the numbers in essentially the same way as our Java program. We'll special case the numbers under 20, as well as two-digit numbers ending in 0 and the number 1,000. When we see a two-digit number that isn't special cased, we'll break it into the tens place and the ones place. To reduce the risk of accidentally substituting part of a larger number, we'll suffix a single-digit number with D to indicate that they're alone. For three-digit numbers, we have to be a bit careful. We can't blindly split off the hundreds place since the number 100 doesn't contain the word and, whereas a number like 101 does. So we'll adopt the following convention. When we write a number followed by two capital Zs, that indicates a pure hundreds number, which doesn't need the word and. If the number ends in two zeros, then it was part of a composite and needs the word and inserted. One of our substitutions will take a number ending in two zeros to a number ending in capital Zs while also producing the word and. Let's talk about how we're going to write this portion of our program first. Remember that we don't have variables, so our program's storage space, as well as any input we wish to supply it, must be part of the source code literally. The last line of our program will act as our input string, and here's how it will work. First, we'll write out all of the numbers from 1 to 19 inclusive, since those are sort of special cases. 
Remember that we're suffixing single-digit numbers with a lowercase d to avoid ambiguity. Now, for the other two-digit numbers, we'll simply write the first digit followed by a dollar sign, and we'll have a substitution that takes the dollar sign to all of the digits. For the three-digit numbers, we'll do the same with a percent sign, and finally, we special case the number 1000. Now let's talk about the substitutions. The first thing we'll do is replace all new lines with the empty string. This allows us to put new lines wherever we want in our program for readability, while ensuring they'll be removed from the final output. Unlike in our 99 bottles of beer program, in this case we don't need to preserve any new lines, so there's no need for a sentinel star or anything like that. We can simply remove all the new lines without having to think about it. Next, we'll expand the dollar sign tokens into all of the two-digit numbers, starting with the given digit. Let's look at exactly what that means. Take the sequence 2 dollar sign, for instance. We want this to expand to all of the numbers from 20 up to 29 inclusive. Specifically, we want to see the numbers 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 written out literally after the substitution. Now, in the course of converting these to digits, we'll end up splitting them up. The number 20 is the only special case in this situation, so the other nine numbers will get split into their tens place and their ones place. Once all of the splitting is done, what we really have is the numbers from 1 to 9, as well as 10 instances of the number 20. This isn't the same set of numbers as before, but since all we care about is the length in words, this set will have the same length as the original. So what we're actually going to do is expand $2 into 10 instances of the number 20, as well as one instance of each one-digit number. We'll need to do this in two steps. Remember, these aren't regular expressions. We can't match a capture group and substitute it into the result wherever we want. We can only match literals and replace them with literals. So we have to be a bit clever. First, we'll match the literal dollar sign and replace it with this. That's nine capital T's followed by a zero, and then each one-digit number written out by hand. Next, we'll take that line of T's and expand it into a bunch of instances of our tens place number with a zero at the end. We do this by writing eight substitutions, each of which is a digit followed by a T, and expands into that digit in the tens place, followed by that digit again. You can think of t as being tens place, but preserve the digit as well. Let's see how this works in the concrete case of two dollar sign. First, we expand the dollar sign to nine t's followed by a zero, and then a bunch of one digit numbers. Now, we perform the substitution which replaces two t with the number 20, followed by a two. This substitution searches our program for instances of a two, followed by a t. We find one of these at the beginning of our input line, so we replace it, consuming one of our t's in the process. Now comes the important part. When slash slash finishes doing one instance of a substitution, it restarts its search for the pattern at the very beginning of the string. So even though the 2 here preceding the t was just put there by our previous substitution, it's eligible to be substituted again, and again, and several more times, until we end up with 10 of them. Now our two dollar sign sequence has expanded to all of the two digit numbers, starting with a 2, just written in a slightly odd way that's conducive to our counting technique. Now we can talk about the hundreds plate. We want to expand each percent sign sequence to a list of three digit numbers, starting with the given digit. Let's see what that actually entails. Again, we'll consider the specific case of 2 here. So we want all of the numbers from 200 to 299 inclusive. The nice thing about three digit numbers is that they break apart neatly. All of the numbers we're discussing right now will break apart into 200 as well as a two digit number. Ignoring the hundreds place for a moment, the two digit part on the right will produce all of the numbers from 1 to 99 inclusive. Exactly once. We already have a way to generate all the numbers from 1 to 99. We'll simply write out the numbers from 1 up to 19, and then use our dollar sign sequences to generate the rest, like we did for numbers under 100. The tricky part is generating the right number of instances of the number 200. Remember the convention we discussed. The number 200 represents the string 200 and as part of a larger string of words, while the number 2ZZ represents the string 200 on its own. With that in mind, we want to produce the string 2ZZ once, representing the number 200 without any 10s or 1s digits, and then on top of that, we want the string 200 to appear 99 times. We're going to do the same encoding we did for the 10s plate a moment ago, but dumping a string of the same character 99 times feels kind of obnoxious, so we'll do it in two steps just to make it a bit shorter. We do all of the three-digit replacements before the two-digit ones, since this replacement sequence will generate dollar signs that the latter will then have to handle. We replace the percent sign with the letter N, followed by eight H's, then 0, 0, and then our sequence of the tens and ones places. The NH sequence is just a fancy way of producing 98 of the letter P. Each H substitutes into 10 P's, and the N at the beginning expands into an M, followed by another 18 P. The M will then, by virtue of 10 substitutions, expand to the digit followed by ZZ, and then we preserve the digit for the next substitution. 
Likewise, the P expands into the 0, 0 sequence, again, preserving the digit for the next substitution. The M gives us our pure hundreds digit, which doesn't contain the word AND. Then we have a total of 98 of the letter P, which produces the hundreds digit with the word AND. Finally, the two trailing zeros terminate our replacement loop, giving us the 99th instance of the hundreds digit with the word AND present. At this point, we've generated a ton of numbers written out numerically. Every single number we've generated is either a value less than 20, a two-digit number ending in a zero, a three-digit number ending in either Z, Z, or 0, 0, or the numerical constant 1000. Now we just replace each of those cases with the number represented in words. First, we'll replace the string of three zeros with D1000. The D will replace the single digit 1 with the word 1 written out in a moment. Second, we'll replace all sequences of 0, 0 with Z, Z, AND, handling the AND portion and leaving behind a pure hundreds value. Then we replace ZZ with the word 100, again preceded by the letter D to indicate a one-digit number that will need to be substituted momentarily. Next, we start substituting in our special cases. Nothing fancy. The numbers 10 to 19, as well as 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 get written out manually. Then the one-digit numbers get written out as well, consuming those lowercase d's we've been using as markers. At this point in the program, we have all the words which make up the numbers from 1 to 1,000. They're not in the right order, but we have the right number of them, so we need to do some counting. Replace every lowercase letter with a star. That's 26 substitutions. Now up to this point, we've been using white space to separate the numbers from each other. But now that we have words, none of the remaining substitutions will require spaces. So replace all spaces in our source code with the empty string. At this point in the program, excluding the remaining substitutions, our pattern string will consist of a number of stars. And the number of stars present is the solution to our Project Euler problem. We need to convert this unary representation of our solution into a decimal number. First, let's convert each digit to its unary representation. We'll use a different character for each place in the resulting number. The stars will represent the ones place, hash signs will represent the tens place, ampersands will give us the hundreds, at signs will be the thousands, and exclamation points will be the ten thousands place. That should be far enough, but in principle we could go further if needed. Our string currently only consists of stars. As your former kindergarten teacher might say, every 10 ones is equivalent to a 10. Put another way, every 10 stars is equivalent to a hash sign. That's our first substitution. Then every 10 tens is equivalent to 100. So we replace sequences of 10 hash signs with an ampersand. Then 10 ampersands with an at sign. Then 10 at signs with an exclamation point. At this point, we have our number represented in some bizarre mix of unary and base 10. Each base 10 digit is represented as a unary value using a separate symbol. It's tempting to immediately replace all of these sequences with their respective digits. After all, we have sequences of length up to 9, where each sequence has one of five different symbol representations. That's 5 times 9, or 45 different substitutions, which isn't too bad to do by hand. But there's a problem with that. If the number we're eventually going to print has a 0 in it anywhere, then we won't recognize that 0, since no pattern will replace a sequence of none of a given character with a numerical 0. So what we're going to do is replace these in a very specific way. At the very end of our starting program, after all of the inputs, I'm going to play six unique characters that appear nowhere else in our program. It doesn't really matter what these six characters are, so I'll just keyboard smash. Now, when we get to the point that we have our bizarre half-unary expansion, we'll start by replacing the ones place. We will only replace the ones place if all six of these characters are present. And in the course of doing the ones digit replacement, we'll consume one of the six characters. This way, we can match any number of stars, including zero stars, by simply burning one of these six unique characters as an esoteric form of fuel. We repeat the same thing for the tens place, consuming a different unique character this time. This ensures all of the characters get replaced in the right order, even if there should be a zero digit. Then the hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands place. Finally, we have one unique character left, which we'll use to delete any leading zeros in case our number happens to be smaller than ten thousand. If the final unique character, a caret, is followed by any zeros, remove those zeros. We can't simply remove all zeros, since that would also remove significant zeros in the middle of the number. Lastly, remove the caret, leaving only our final answer. There are no more substitutions in our program, so the remaining characters, the digits of our solution, are printed verbatim. And this solves Project Euler problem number 17 in Slash Alash. Tune in next time when we solve problem number 18 in GNU Make, the command line build tool.